this plane crashes right out of a Final Destination movie. So you do watch movies. I watch what's on the airplane. The flight here had a Jeffrey Riddick collection. Final Destination, Tamara, Dead Awake, Don't Look Back, Day of the Dead, The Final Wish, The Call. You know, I finally got to see his short film, The Good Samaritan. That's my point. Ever since Jeffrey Reddick started making movies, people have been dying in strange ways even I don't understand. And your theory is what? That it isn't death after these people? That Jeffrey is somehow affecting the real world just by making movies? Since the 80s. New Line Cinema is known as the house that Freddie built ever since that first nightmare on Elm Street inspired a young Jeffrey Reddick. This kid from Kentucky has been at the center of one unexplained event after another. Wherever he goes, horror follows. Death follows. And sometimes, a substantial box office grows for ticket sales. No, Mulder, that's just not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Wrong. The only reason this guy's first movie got turned into a movie was because someone stopped him from putting you through your own final destination. What? It's right there in the X-Files, splattered in black ink and red blood. Jeffrey Reddick was going to sell the idea that became Final Destination as an episode of the X-Files. And we would have been his next victims? Not we. You and your brother. Let's say I believe you. To what end? That's the best part. I already got someone on it. Another agent. Even better. The host for Queer History with Stephanie. I love that show. Is Stephanie interviewing Jeffrey? She's interviewing Jeffrey as we speak. Mulder, next time just lead with that. Let's turn on the camera so we can see what they're discussing. So, um, one of my first questions for you, Jeff. Um, do you, actually, do you prefer Jeff or Jeffrey? Uh, Jeffrey makes me feel young, so we can, yeah, it makes me feel like, like my mom used to go Jeffrey all the time, so Jeffrey's good. Oh, oh okay, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, could I ask you something about early in the days of Final Destination, before it was even a movie? Um, yeah. Can, can we talk about the first version, back when it was an idea for X-Files? You talked to Adam Green's Scary Sleepover a little bit about it, and I, I, I'm actually dying thinking about Final Destination, but from the point of view of Mulder and Scully. <laughs> yeah. Then Mulder is like, no, Scully, it was death. Coming back to claim what it was owed. And Scully saying, Mulder, that's not how this works. Yeah. No, it was interesting because I was trying to get a TV agent um, at the time. And so they, you know, your a TV agent would ask that you write a sample script for something that was on the air. And so X-Files was one of my favorite shows, you know, still is, but one of my favorite shows at the time, especially. And so I was trying to think of a spec script to write. And I had I had the premonition idea and getting off the plane and people death coming after them, but I hadn't figured out what story to put it in yet. So that gave me a context of what the story in. And and that story, uh Charles Scully, who was um was her brother, or not Charles Scully, but um Charles who was who was um um Scully's brother, who we never really saw much. I think her other brother got some screen time, but there was like the other brother that we didn't see much mm -hmm. up until the point that I'd written the script. Um, he had the premonition. A group of adults got off the plane and they started dying. And they, you know, everybody in the script thought it was her brother doing it. So by this point, she was having a, cri a crisis of faith because she's like, you know, my family members keep dying and keep. Get, you know, so she was thinking about quitting the X-Files over it. And um, yeah, the the manifestation in that, and it's always interesting with this, because it's indicative of even the writing process is like you start off with an idea and you workshop it and you try to figure out the best way to do it. And in that version, since, you know, death couldn't come back and just kill them. But what we learned was like, this, there's a sheriff that was investigating along with them um, in, in New Jersey, and uh, we found out that the sheriff had, had been shot and flatlined at the same time the plane crashed. So when the sheriff came back, death kind of came back in, you know, in him and was the one killing everybody. Um, so when I sent that, you know, when I was showing that to my friends at New Line, they're like, this is a great idea. Like, don't send it to the show. Like, this is a great idea for a movie. So I took that idea um, and worked with a couple of producers, Craig Perry and Warren Zide on it and Chris Bender. And um, yeah, we just developed it as a, as a feature length story. You know, originally it was all going to be adults um, and then Scream came out and then New Line was like, teenagers are hot again, make them all teenagers. I'm like, all right, cool. 
So, you know, it's, again, it's kind of rolling with, you know, you always want to tra- stay true to your story and your concept, but also if you're working at a studio, especially you realize like sometimes the market demands, you know, you kind of, you kind of learn to roll with the flow on that one. So. Yeah. And hopefully just be able to hold on to what made it authentic to you. Yeah. Yeah. We got to explore the older characters in the second one, which is great. So, uh, you know, I intentionally set the second one up to be like, Oh, we think we're going to focus on this, these four teenagers that are going on this trip. And then you meet adult characters and then you bring, you know, clear back from the first movie. So I got to examine a more adult world, um, um and the screenwriters eric bress and j mackie gruber who wrote the screenplay uh really did a great job of expanding on that but we got to get to the adults in the second one but i think that the teenagers in the first one was definitely the right call yeah that well the script i um i think bloody disgusting um if i'm wrong i apologize bloody disgusting but um they i i gave it to them to put online so you can find it online it's called, called flight 180 um and the only thing is because i had typed it at work and i found the script but i couldn't find the cover page so i put i just guesstimated like the date on that i put on the cover page so some fans were like well this has to be fake because this doesn't match the timeline of where the show was and i'm like guys i just that's the i just pulled that copyright out of my butt so i may have written it a year earlier a year later i'm not sure exactly i was just guesstimating um so yeah you can find that on the online it's a fun i think it's a fun read it's and it's fun to see the different completely different kind of take on that same concept but with characters that we know you know yeah for sure uh you said that you love horror as a genre because it offers a gateway for such a diverse group of people to process the same things and maybe even find kinship and community i wonder could you tell me about your relationship with the horror genre and the horror community, what did it start like and how has it changed over time? Um, You know, my love of horror definitely goes back to when I was, you know, a teenager, like me and my friends, you know, my two best friends used to just watch them all the time. And it was a great bonding experience. Um, And I didn't get to go to my first Fangoria until I was 19, I think, because I moved to New York and finally got to go to a big horror convention. Um, And that was the first time I met you know, fans, but I was completely going as a fan. So it was so cool to just meet other fans and, and meet some some of the, you know, horror celebrities that I grew up like really wanting to meet. Um, and then the, the cool thing about working at New Line Cinema, um, I started working there when I was 19 and then worked there for 11 years is, you know, I got to meet through work. I got to meet a lot of um, the horror people that I had admired um, kind of growing up, you know, creatively, I got to meet with with them. And then after Final Destination came out, you know, there was a flip, um, you know, where the horror fans were talking to me and it was just, you know, it was, it was a great full circle thing because it still the little kid in me is always, you know, happy about doing horror and, you know, eternally grateful for, you know, the impact that Final Destination has had on the zeitgeist. But um, yeah, I just, you know, the fans, like every horror person you talk to will say this, but the fans are the most, you know, loving, like kind of loyal, uh, you know, that that's just the, you know, they will, they will, you know, they'll call you out on some of the stuff you do that they don't like for sure, but they will follow, you know, if they like, if the fans like your work, they will follow all of your work Um, and, some of my most obscure stuff like I it's just cool when fans go up and they're like that's my favorite movie of yours and I'm like that's awesome um because it's um so I yeah there's just so there's always a great sense of community when I go to conventions or or festivals um you know I think it's probably because the horror genre is still despite how financially successful it is it's still not considered in a lot of artistic circles um at the same level of other genres, which is a shame uh, because there's so much love and passion and artistry that goes into making any kind of film or TV show. Um, so I think there's kind of this outsider edge to, to horror, um, which is also, I think, kind of indicative of the fan base. I think, you know, we, you know, we do get, you know, we, we absolutely have a lot of people that were like the popular, you know, jocks in school and stuff like that. But, you know, we also have a lot of fans who are like, kind of the geeks and the in the freaks for lack i'm just you know 
retitling a TV show, but um, a lot of people like, felt like they didn't quite fit in um, and who gravitate to, to the genre, I think, because that genre, you know, usually the, the kind of final girl or final guy in a horror film is usually not the most popular, you know, kid in school. It's usually the, somebody who is kind of on the outside of the in-group um, who ends up kind of rising up and, and vanquishing evil. So no matter how much society changes and even, you know, we've gone, you know, we didn't have the internet as we have it today when I was growing up. Well, we didn't have the internet for, well, for a while while I, while I was growing up. But then what the internet's changed into now is kind of the, the way that teenagers communicate now. Like a lot of people are on their phones all the time, but there's still a lot of the same um, issues, you know, as far as like people trying to connect with each other, but then you have people kind of online putting up fake versions of their lives or like only showing the good stuff. So people compare and contrast and, you know, cyberbullying is a, you know, huge issue. Um, so I still think we have a lot of issues that we used to have in schools that are still reflective of the younger people, which tend to tend to be the horror demographic. Like, you know, people like me will go see every horror film. So it's not like we age out uh, and stop seeing these films. So the people I know, you know, who grew up loving films that are making films now still go and see films all the time. So um, it's just a great community of like, from, you know, people that I've met who didn't have kids when I first started off, who now are, are bringing their kids to horror conventions, um, which is great, uh, to bring in their parents to bring their kids and their parents to horror conventions. So it's a very cool, it's just a great community. Well, um, okay, I got another question, and this is going to take you back in time, okay? Um, now, it is about the final destination, but in a different way. It's about the premiere, and mm -hmm. you took the time to go on the Rosie O'Donnell show and bring your high school English teacher as a guest, and you said not just because you promised you would if you ever became a famous screenwriter, but because you cherished the role she played in your journey. And I wondered, could you take us back to that day? What do you remember? What was it like meeting Rosie? Did your teacher end up seeing Lion King on Broadway? Yeah, that was, I, that was one of my fondest memories, as well as kind of seeing it in my hometown with my mom and my sister able to come. Um, but yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I've always known that I was going to be in the entertainment industry. You know, I originally wanted to act. And then um, when that was, you know, a little difficult, I decided I was going to get into writing. And so English was always, besides act, my dream of acting, we didn't have any acting programs in, in our school. So English was my, my favorite subject. And so I had, um, I had, you know, my line of English teachers from Miss Toller to Miss Murphy to Miss Bellamy were like, in, in high school were very critical, but Miss Bellamy kind of went above and beyond. Like she, she actually did set up like a one semester, like, like acting workshoppy adjacent program to our English class. And we all got to put on like a performance at the, for the whole school. And, you know, she just really pushed me to like, believe in myself and, you know, have confidence that I could do whatever I wanted to do. And my mom was always very supportive about me having a great future and being confident in myself, but she was also very confident that I should not study acting. <laughs> She's like, I know you want to do this, but you need to have a real job. Um, and so I, I lied to her about what I was studying in college. I told her I was studying science until I got in the first play. And I, of course I invited her to see it. So I had to tell her and she's like, ah, oh, Jeffrey, what am I going to do with you? So, but no, but Miss Bellamy, like, you know, that's what, you know, teachers, teachers are very education. My mom instilled this into me from an early age, you know, learning how to read and write, you know, and do math. The basics of, of education were crucial to, to kind of achieving anything in life. And it doesn't mean you have to know how to read and write to, to achieve anything. She just was very forceful about, you know, our, us valuing our education. And so um, I had some amazing teachers in all different aspects of, of the field. And um, they just do some, you know, parents don't necessarily realize how much work um, that teachers do and how much they're underpaid and understaffed. Like I had teachers all the time who were bringing in school supplies um, and because, you know, kids didn't 
didn't have them and the schools didn't have the funds to provide them. And, you know, we spend a lot of our lives, you know, going to school and it's very important. And, you know, my mom was very involved in, you know, knowing what was going on with our school. Like I think most parents have been, it's, I feel it's kind of sad that things have gotten so politicized lately where, you know, teachers are being demonized, but I feel like that goes back to education's the people that demonize education the most are the ones that have gone to like the most prestigious Harvard's and Yale's. So they've made sure they get an education and their kids get like a top tier education. But then once they get it, they start demonizing. Cause I think they really don't want people to, you know, cause there's two aspects to education. There's the learning aspect of it. And there's the social aspect, like, not to get off topic, it's kind of on topic, but I'll bring it back. But, you know, in college, you know, where I grew up, like, I went to Berea College, which is an amazing liberal arts college in, in Kentucky. And they take like 70 some percent of their students from the Appalachian region, um, which is a covers like so many states. This is like a massive region. Um, and they give you a really good education and no tuition. You just work like 10 hours a week on campus. Um, and so a lot of kids who would not be able to afford a great education get like a top level education at the school. And so many of the kids that I met there had never met a person of color till they came to college. Um, and a lot of the kids were like, yeah, my parents are really, you know, racist, you know, that's just, they, they, that's how they were raised, you know? So, and I've never met a person who wasn't white until I came to college. So a lot of times the, stuff that goes on, you know, like when those kids went back to their families and were like calling out their racist stuff. And I'm not saying everybody in Appalachia is racist. Let me just clarify that for sure. But I'm just saying, you know, when they would go back and challenge their parents' racist thinking, they're like, what is that school doing to my kids? And it's like, it's not indoctrinating your kids. It's just your kids are meeting people that aren't like the people in your hometown. So that's going to open up their worldview and meet, they're meeting people from other countries and meeting Muslims and, you know, Hindus and Buddhists. And so that's the part of the college experience that I think is so important is it gets people out of their small town bubble. And if you, you know, if your parents raised you right, I'm sorry, college is not going to change your values. Like I didn't go magically go to college and like lose any of my values. Actually, if anything, my values helped me do well in college. Um, but sorry, that's, but back to my English teacher, um, education is just very important to me. And it's, it's, um, and with Miss Bellamy, I did tell her when I was in, in school that when I made it, I didn't say if, I said, when I make it, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring you to the premiere and I'm going to take you to a Broadway show. And it's so funny because I wasn't expecting it to, to happen. I had talked to my boss at New Line about it. Um, but I was like, you know, I want to bring her to the premiere. And I told them the story and they're like, well, what else is she like? And I said, well, she loves Rosie, the Rosie O'Donnell show. Um, and then they got on it and they called the Rosie O'Donnell show up and, you know, Rosie, you know, was and is a big proponent of educators. So yeah, they had us come on and, you know, my teacher got to throw the ball at the beginning and um, Martin Sheen was on the show as a special guest. And um, was it Martin or Charlie? Martin. And his wife was from Kentucky, so he came up to us like after the show. It was really cool. I didn't know that part. Wow, dynamite, dude! I'm so jealous of what you got to experience there. That's so cool. It was, it was, it was, and it wasn't because I I got to be on Rosie. It was really because I got to bring my teacher on Rosie. Um, it felt so heartwarming watching the two of you on screen. Yeah. No, she she's she's no longer with us, unfortunately. She uh, passed of cancer a couple of years ago. But yeah, that was um, that was just a great. It was just a great experience, and um, yeah, went to the Lion King, and yeah, it was just it was just like that, that's you know I I'm just a big proponent of like being a good person and trying to give back because I I know if people hadn't have taking a chance on me or open a door for me, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I would, I still believe I would have been in this business. Some, I would have gotten here somehow, but it would have probably been a lot harder and a lot more painful if I didn't 
you know, have people take a chance or give me an opportunity. And I, you know, all those opportunities came out of something I put out in the world. You know, like, that's what I always tell people, like, you've got to keep trying because you don't know how that's going to come back to you. It may not be a direct line to what you want, but you'll find out maybe a year later or two years later, or like, oh, this was like a detour and got me to my final destination. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah, it was just really nice to give my teacher some the acknowledgement, you know, and all teachers, you know, that wasn't just for her, but just to give the teacher, you know, my teacher an acknowledgement of how much she, you know, her belief in, in all my, again, this goes for all my teachers, how much the education they gave me, the perspectives they gave me, um, the time that they spent, like, caring and, again, working so hard uh, to make sure that we could learn as much as possible was, you know, so important to to me. And so I just wanted to show my gratitude to her. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, yeah. um, now, could I ask you a question more, um, just a few questions about craft. Mm -hmm. One is, now, what do you see as essential to the experience of a horror story? I think the biggest thing is something I said earlier is kind of making you care about the characters. Um, because you, there are definitely horror films that are concept driven. So it's just the concept. And, you know, some might argue that Final Destination is a concept driven kind of franchise, you know, where it's really about the opening set piece. But, you know, with that first film, like, you know, I wanted to have like, you know, a really, you know, kind of layered final guy. You know, I wanted to turn that final girl trope on its head. Um, and, you know, I think Devin Sawa brings such a great, you know, deliver such a great performance in that role, like just bringing so, so much emotion, emotion and depth to a film. And if you don't care about your leads, um, your lead characters in a horror film, then you don't really care what happens to them. So I think that's the biggest ingredient to like get audiences on a ride for, for a film is really making you care about what's going on with the, the lead characters. And then you tr you definitely try to there's no new stories to tell really if you think about it like everything's a variation on something that's been told just because civilization's been around for so long sure. but you know for me i try to look at like what is the what is it about this story that's going to connect with people um so uh, obviously with final destination like we all have a fear of death like you know that's a universal fear so that's that's what I tapped in with that one. You know, with Nightmare on Elm Street, Wes Craven, we all sleep. We all have to go to sleep at night. And so he created a killer. It's like, well, you you can escape them during the day, but you have to sleep sometimes. So I think trying to find that, there's so much that connects us, like, uh, you know, emotionally, but it's trying to find that hook into the story that that is also crucial to to, to telling a, a good horror film. And then I th I think once you do that, like, that's what I love about the genre is you can have everything from like this most straightforward slasher movie to, you know, an M. Night Shyamalan twisty, you know, uh, twisty supernatural movie or sci-fi. There's so much that falls under the umbrella of horror, in my opinion. So I love that you can also just have fun with it. There's you can try new things. You can, you know, muck with the formula like Barbarian, which came out, of, you know, a couple of years ago did a great job of you know had a hard time getting made because it it didn't follow the traditional 3x structure but what a great movie like what you know a great movie i was <laughs> stunned yeah yeah so um but yeah i think character i think characters and then some some universality to to your so caring about your characters also means that they have to be smart and not do silly things you know uh Oh, it's yeah, not just making them sweet too stupid to live yeah yeah like there's a lot of movies where you're watching where it's like you're, you're making every right like and there's this psychological thing where audiences they've done studies on this where audiences always think they're smarter than the character in anything that they're watching so we always go into a movie thinking oh well this is how, what i would do if if 
my holiday party were overrun by terrorists or, you know, if I was ca camping in the woods and somebody, so we always, you know, are think that we're smarter, but you never know how you react. So you have to make sure that your characters just don't do like, you know, the characters falling all the time. Like that used to be a thing. It's like, you're running from a very slow killer and you trip and fall like five times. It's like, come on. Right. right. Come on. It's so hard to balance the sense of, realism and authenticity but also like to to show something entertaining yeah not the character always yeah i would like to get a little more specific um in a recent interview you expressed gratitude that for part six of final destination filmmakers called you to make sure the next installment honors the core elements of the franchise now what do you see as the essential elements of a final destination movie well it was interesting because it was it was really nice that they reached out to me you know it's you don't see that often actually you don't usually see that ever um <laughs> in the in the movie business so when guy and stephanie reached out to me um it was really it was just really nice talking to them um and, and you know what i i told them that you know there's a couple things that i just over the years especially that i've seen that because i'm very tapped into the fans and like what they love about the franchise and um so it's not it's not about it's not about the actual kills themselves i think that that are super important when you're writing a final death destination death scene it's about the suspense building up to it where you don't know where it's all the misdirection and twists um i did tell them tony todd <laughs> like <laughs> tony todd is crucial in my opinion and should never not be in a final destination movie um, which they were in complete agreement on. So, um, and I actually told them one thing that I wanted to kind of get back into the franchise that hasn't been in it for a little bit is, you know, I never wanted to have a film where all the characters die at the end. Like I wanted, and that's not really canon if you look at the first three films, um, because Clear lived, and then in the second movie, um, Kimberly and the, and the deputy lived as well. But then in the DVD extras on part three, there was a clipping that said that they had died in a weird accident, but that's not been in the film. So it's not canon. But then the later film started going with the kind of everybody gets die, everybody gets killed at the end. So I said, I would really like to kind of reverse course on that if we can, because I, you know, my thinking is like, you can't cheat death but you can prolong life. Like that was kind of my message so that you can prolong life and live, you know, maybe appreciate more like the time you have and you're living like life to the fullest as opposed to like, we're gonna see everybody die at the end of every Final Destination film. So um, those were kind of the 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 things and, and they know, I mean, they're very smart writers um, and they're fans, which makes it really, you know, amazing. So they've they've seen the film. So they kind of knew most of you know, they're very smart people. So they've seen it. They really studied them and they they know what makes the Final Destination films tick. But, you know, I think that that last element was probably the only thing that I told them that maybe they hadn't, you know, didn't know was kind of my perspective is I'd really like to kind of weave that back in if we can, mm. um, that everybody doesn't die because that's not the message I want to leave. And plus the brains, the business side of my brain goes at some point we're going to, why are we going to want to see a movie where we know everybody's going to die at the end anyway, even though it's a fun ride. Like, Yes. And I think uh, even to <laughs> that, uh, I love your point about, well, the thing we're grappling with is not, can we cheat death because such a thing will not happen, but how do we enrich our lives until that moment comes? And even being in a final destination kind of premise, it doesn't change the decision to engage with your life and your worthiness with whatever time you have left. Yeah. I think if the movie misses that, it's kind of lost the humanity that drew it to, drew us to it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to make sure that that never happens because I think they've, you know, again, I've enjoyed like all the films and the filmmakers that have come into the franchise. It's been, you know, it's just been, it's just been exciting to see like, new perspectives and and things like that but yeah and the, that's the thing i love having because craig perry the producer is like kind of like always calling like 
the godfather, the grandfather of the, the films, not because he's older, but because, you know, he was wiser than me when I sold the first one. He was the producer and he's kind of the shepherd of, of the of the franchise and he knows it and, you know, loves it as much as I do. And, you know, he's very mindful of like making sure that the tone is always. We have thrills in there, but it's not mean spirited like there's fun to it like it's a roller coaster ride um so he's very mindful of like also just what a final destination film is which again i think hopefully will make you think a little bit but is also just a fun roller coaster ride which is you know those are the kind of horror films that i love me too i, I like the ones that are fun rides but also when i revisit them there's something deeper to revisit I really want to hear anything you have to say about Joy Mann and the teenage years of your career. What do we need to understand about that part of your story and that person? Um, that's a very, very important part of my story. Um, and Bob Shea and Joy Mann are, are two crucial parts. Because, yeah, I saw the first Nightmare on Elm Street when I was 14. Wrote a prequel. I sent it to Bob Shea. I felt, you know, I lived, again, 14-year-old living in Kentucky. I knew nothing about the film business. But I found his address you know i called information and got his address and mailed him my prequel idea and he sent it back because it was unsolicited and then i wrote him back and i'm like look sir i've spent three dollars on your movie so i think you can take five minutes to read my story and he had thankfully got back to me and read it and it was very encouraging and his assistant joy um was just an amazing she's she's no longer with us unfortunately either but she was such an amazing woman and she she would stay in touch with me from age 14 till 19. She would send me scripts. You know, she was helping encouraging my writing. I I used to call her collect sometimes because I, you know, again, I didn't know any better at the time. Like you're you're a kid. This was back in the this was back in the 80s. Um, and so she would send me scripts and you know, tchotchkes from like movies and taught me what tchotchkes meant. I didn't even know what that was. Um, and she was just an amazing woman. So when I went to New Line, um, Bob offered me an internship there. And Joy just, you know, was the sweetest woman. She just like took me under her wing right away. Um, I remember the first time I was, the first internship I had there, I just remember this one time where I had just started off. And, you know, it's very overwhelming to go from like, you know, rural America to New York City. And I was there studying acting and I was doing an internship. And um, I remember I messed up something at my internship and like the executive there yelled at me. And I was like nervous that she was gonna, they were gonna fire me like, and I went and talked to Joy. I was like, yeah, oh, I just messed this up. And she was like, did, I'm not gonna say what word she is, but she was like, did that person yell at you? Um, and she goes, I, <laughs> yeah, she was like a mother hen with me. Um, and it was great. I, I loved her and I love her and her family so much. They were just amazing people. And again, just another example of somebody who didn't have to take, and the same with Bob, he didn't have to respond to my, my letter when I wrote him when I was young and she didn't have to take the time that she took with me. And I tried to be, I tried to be very careful about not calling her all the time or every week or anything like crazy like that. But she would answer my calls and she would call me back and you could I could tell she loved talking to me um and she just encouraged you know just encouraged me you know with like the possibilities of what I could do but it was very much like here I'm going to send you some scripts to read so you can study them so it was very much also making sure that I worked on bettering myself as a writer um because when you're young you think you're the best writer in the world and then you know so she was very very good at like guiding me to better myself so by the time I got to New Line um it, and she had told me over the phone I'd written stuff and sent it in she's like oh I got good coverage it's just not right for us but you know here's some areas I think you can focus on and then when I got to New Line and I actually went through the files and found the coverage of my stuff it was off like if she just sent it to me I would have quit writing it was like this story this script was obviously written by a somebody in middle school and I'm like I was in high school <laughs> how dare you like so she did a great job of like being like nurturing but also like pushing me um without so she wasn't just being like oh they loved it but it's you know she was like well focus on this and this so it's just you know again it's about that human connection and like 
you know, just meeting such a good person. And, you know, I have to say the difference between now and then is like, you know, New Line and the studios, most of them were run by film lovers, especially New Line. I mean, Bob Shea loved, you know, Eve, yeah, I mean, eats, breathed, and, and sleeps film. Like he loves, he still does, but, you know, he was a passionate film lover. Um, and he took a chance on making Nightmare on Elm Street. And then when I got there, the studio was taking creative chances all the time. And not even chances, just being original. You know, they made Blade, which is actually the first Black Marvel superhero movie. Um, and everybody back in the day was like, nobody's going to pay to go see a Black superhero. And they made like Dumb and Dumber and House Party and The Mask. And, you know, they made so many I'm skipping over some amazing ones, but they just they would take chances because they were, they all love film so much and they wouldn't worry. They were like, if we make a good film, well, the audience will we we can market it and bring the audience to see it. Now we've had a lot of like business and tech people kind of getting onto boards and kind of the companies merging. And so everything is so numbers driven now that you don't have those passionate film lovers running most of the major places. I'm not saying they don't run several of them, but I'm just saying it's not the majority because, you know, a lot of these, the studios now they have to, they're legally obligated to their shareholders. So if they don't make a shareholder profit, they get sued or they get in trouble. So even if they want to be like really open to creatives, they don't have the option because it's like, we have this, we have to make as much money as possible for our shareholders. So usually if you're going to make the most money, you're going to play things safe, which means you're going to remake movies that have already been told or make sequels or prequels or requels or <laughs> something based off of a book or a comic book. Like, so original content is, that's changed. Like the appreciation of original content has changed because the focus is so much on making, you know, making the corporation money, which I, I get that, but you know, there's a balance between playing it safe all the time and because you see original stuff do well all that you do see it happen but somebody's got to take it you know new line took a huge risk on lord of the rings you know doing a trilogy of films like everybody in the industry was like well this you know that was the dumbest thing they could have that was the dumbest thing they could have ever done is is put that much money into like a huge franchise with this you know wacky director from new zealand who's done a lot of great you know crazy horror films um, yeah, I think at the, point, at the time, his biggest movie was, I think, The Frighteners. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. suggest that you could take on Lord of the Rings at all, but... Yeah, but Bob knew, but Bob and the and the people at New Line knew. Like, they, they, they had been, they had done enough with filmmakers like Wes Craven, you know, filmmakers like, you know, Rusty Cundiff, and there are just so many filmmakers that they, that they broke into the, the business um, that they knew, like, like he's got a vision and he he can make this film happen and so it was just taking a risk like and um so i i love that part about working at new line at that period because it was it was just such a wonderfully creative you know place to work and everybody was it really was like of course people wanted to make a profit you know they wanted movies to be successful but they would they would look for good projects um sure. over like what's an ip that we can because yeah lord of the rings was a known brand but they'd had the cartoon version of it but to make a live action version with peter jackson was like at that big of a financial commitment was like they were like this is insane uh -huh. um and it you know it paid off you know with great movies and great success but now again it's like yeah, that I miss that spirit in the industry. And, you know, when New Line got bought by Warner Brothers, like they fired like the whole basically the whole New York office, which was, I think, 400 and some people. Um, they laid up hundreds of more. And like, you know, this happens all the time now. Like that's the good side and the bad side of this business is every time there's a corporate another corporate merger, it's like thousands and thousands of employees will get laid off. Um which sucks because a lot of them have put, oh, sorry. I don't know why my alarm went off. Oh, I know why my alarm went off because we were going to do our interview at one. So yeah, that's the, 
you know, I miss those creative days, Bad New Line. Again, it was just a wonderful time. And like what we've seen now is, you know, that that division, of, you know, the New York office of New Line doesn't exist any longer because when Warner Brothers bought it out, it was like, well, we already have people that do this and this. So they just fired, a, they laid off everybody. And some of the people have worked there for 30 years. And it's just, that's, that's one of the downsides they see of, of where we're trending now, where it's like, let's see how we can make the most content with the least amount of creative people. Um, you know, because that's at the end of the day, that's what any business, of course, I guess, if you're just about business, if you're just like, I want to make money and that's it, then you're going to try to figure out like the, the best model that you can do that requires the least amount of people. But, you know, we, you know, when I was growing up at New Line, I, I, you know, it was very much about nurturing like a creative community. It's like, oh, we've met these amazing filmmakers, you know, like, let's do something with them and let's build something with them. And I think a lot, a lot of that's missing now in the industry. Um, but I think a lot of that is going to be picked up with creative communities just around the United States and around the world. Like there are production companies everywhere and productions in every state now. So there's a lot more opportunity to make, make your own content. You can make a movie on your iPhone, you know, you can buy lenses and make a movie on your iPhone and yeah. looks it's so the technology is great because it's, I think it's open doors for people like, you know, I had the VHS recorders in high school, the clunky VHS recorders to record films on and that was it. And now people can shoot a whole film on their, on their phone. It's and edit it. And yeah, it's crazy. You're right. I mean, I remember making a high school short film. I was editing it on two VCRs, cutting footage. Yeah, <laughs> so I know. <laughs> Slicing them. I know. Yeah. Spli yeah. No, that was a that was a skill that we have. <laughs> oh my god. Um, well, let me see. Let me see what's the next question. Um, no, you talked a lot about Bob Shea, and um, I talk a lot about every everything you ask me. I'm like blah 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 blah. No, well, I I appreciate it. You know, uh, <laughs> you never know what's really going to turn out to be so authentic and vulnerable and really move people who watch it. Yeah, uh, and you've given so many great stories already. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, you know, I did want to ask you because you've talked about what Bob Shea wrote back to you in the feedback. You have a furtive imagination, but you lack structure. Now, what I wonder, because you are so much deeper into your career now, what would you have said to yourself if it had been you reading that script instead of Bob? Um. I think I probably would have said the same thing. I would have, um, he's just, he's a little more gruff. Um, and yeah, he, he was like, you have, yeah, a fertile imagination. He goes, but he, but he was like, but, but I think you just need to read more scripts to study structure. But at that point I was just so happy he wrote me back. I didn't even take that as negative. I was just like, all right, my imagination is fertile. Um, and I just need to study structure. So I will bother, I'll get scripts from joy and call her a lot and, and learn this. So I just took that as like, all right, that's what I have to do. Like, so I would probably say the, almost the same thing, except I'm, I try, I try to be a little more, it depends on the, who the person is. I mean, if, if they're young, young, I definitely try to be super sensitive that they don't, because I don't want to say anything that's going to like crush their hopes or like sidetrack them so i try to put everything at a positive like about here's where you should i think you should study more um and a lot of people are open to that a lot of people aren't you know that's the one thing i've learned you know as i've gotten older like there's it doesn't matter what age you are but um there are yeah there are some younger people that are like my script's great like this is the best script you're ever going to read and they're like 17 i'm like First of all, I, I can't read scripts anymore unless they come through agents. I always have to t tell them that. So that's always a because I have people like hitting me up oh, every day to read their scripts. And I, I wish I had the time. I mean, the luxury that Bob had at New Line was that he was a, it was a company and they had people who did coverage for them. So he could get coverage. I don't actually even know if he ever read the script, to be honest. Like, yeah, he may have just gotten coverage on it. Um, I know how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. So um i have my cats so but they don't know how to read so they're not very they're not very helpful with scripts but 
I do speak to a lot of, you know, schools and organizations and stuff. And I do, I'm just, I try to be honest about my experience and I make it very clear that my career experience is so much different. Um, like there was another Jeff that worked out of the Los Angeles office. I worked out of the New York one who had read my story. And so he pulled a me on Bob Shea, but like 15 years later, um, where he had this idea for something and Bob didn't, it was like, and then he was like, he was just very insistent. And um, he called me up after he got like hired at New Line. He's like, yeah, I, I read your story and I pulled a you and my name's Jeff as well. So we became really good friends, Jeff Katz. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that was also a different, that was a specific capsule of time where New Line, Nightmare on Elm Street had just come out. So New Line, you know, is known as the house that Freddie built because that franchise did build New Line into being the massive, amazing studio. Um, but I got the, you know, I happened to write him like before they got super huge, you know, they were still, the movie was still out in theaters when I wrote him. So he had some time on his hands and I think he was probably feeling very grateful that the movie was doing so well. Um, so he, yeah, he, re, you know, he responded to this kid in Kentucky. So I, I try to be very encouraging about my life experiences, but also let people know like the. The, even the business has changed since I I was growing up. So you would your your chances of actually getting in the head of a studio to like even see your email is like just not what it used to be. Like because New Line was a very small company at the time, <laughs> and so now you have like you have the studios with like thousands of employees. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but now I think it's we've gotten into a world more where it's like since we have the tools to make stuff, the best thing you can do is make things, you know, start off like all the filmmakers that have longer careers, either you, directors, you see them, they started directing when they were teenagers, when they were, you know, in school, they were making films with their friends. And it's like, learn through trial and error, especially since you have the technology now, like that you literally can make something that they can show in a theater on your phone. Like, so use that technology that you have to like learn and figure out who you are as a filmmaker and a storyteller um, and use the energy you have and that optimism you have that when you're a youth to like just grow and soak in as much as you can, like by watching movies or reading scripts or books. Um, well, you never have the, oh, go ahead, so sorry. I, I do have a question more about that use for you. When you were so young at 19, you said you went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. Yeah. And um, that's when Bob offered you the internship at New Line Cinema. It turned into an 11-year stint at the studio. Um, you've talked a lot about what it was like working with New Line Cinema, but at the uh, American Academy of Dramatic Arts, what was that experience like? How does that part of your story differ? Um, that was an amazing experience. I mean, like I said, my dream growing up was to be an actor. And so I did really well in theater at Berea and I got into the summer program at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which, you know, the fame TV series was based off of. So, and it's very, it was very, it is still, it was very prestigious. So it was very hard to get into. So I, that was a crazy, wonderful, like summer, you know, um, and I went there, I was expecting to be like fame where people were dancing in the streets or in the hallways all the time. And that, that wasn't the case. Um, but no, I had a really wonderful time there. Um, I was very fortunate, like one of my acting colleagues in, in the class, um, her mother was a casting agent. I didn't know it at the time. Like apparently everybody else in the class did because everybody was trying to talk to her. And I'm just like, you know, I talked to everybody because that's just the way that I am. And so we ended up becoming friends because she realized I didn't know who she was and I didn't want anything from her. And um, so she ended up, get, you know, introducing me to her mom and her mom got me a lot of like background work. And so I started, you know, getting just a lot of background work and a couple of like one liners here and there. And I got an acting agent. Um, so that was that was going really well. But the kind of reality of that time period uh, which my agent very succinctly, you know, said to me, but, you know, there weren't many options if you were a person of color, of any color. Um, you know, they're, they're just, 
you were just not in the pool of talent that he looked at. So my agent told me one time, and she this is wasn't cruel. This is just the reality of the time, and she wasn't even being mean about it. But she's like, "You're like an ethnic Michael J. Fox, like because I always typecast you in Hollywood. Like, what is your type?" And she's like, "You're like an ethnic Michael J. Fox." And I'm like, "Well, that's great because everybody likes Michael. Everybody loves Michael J. Fox. He's fucking awesome." And she's like, "Yes, but they don't write roles for ethnic Michael J. Foxes." She's like, "If you." rapped or played basketball because that was the big trend at the time like you know a lot of like movies with rappers in them and things like that but if i kind of did the stereotypical things that you know i'm biracial but if i did the stereotypical things that a black person did at the time they were like maybe we could get you in but that's like you know actresses at the time well if you can play the sassy best friend or a prostitute you know we can get you roles so once i kind of realized that that was the case because it's and i saw that at the studio too and it it's just the best way to describe it is like there was just there's a pool of talent that they that casting people go to first like the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of you know all american girl you know is is a is a white girl and my mom's white i love white people i, I love throwing that out there i've dated some white people so don't think i'm racist because for saying this but but that was just the go-to pool of talent for so long in hollywood and there were so many times where somebody who, you know, was a person of, of color of any race again would come in and they're like, that person blew away everybody in this audition, but we can't, this person, we can't sell them as a lead. Like they can't be the lead in the film. We don't want to have them in an interracial relationship with the white person. Like there's all this kind of politics that go into it. And so instead of kind of giving up and going home, I'm like, well, I'm working at New Line. I will just write stuff and put myself in it you know i keep writing about teenagers getting murdered so obviously um i think i'm even past playing a (laughs) teenager on the cw like i think 30 is the cutoff for playing on the old cw stuff but um but yeah like acting is still something that i had a hold there in my heart and i put i've done some cameos in my own stuff but um yeah like it was a it was a great time and it's a dream i have never really given up on it's just i haven't really pursued it either because i've been so focused on the writing and producing and and now directing stuff but um yeah i still love to perform and i've actually you know i think covid gave a lot of us a lot of time to kind of sit back and take stock in life and i was like yeah once i get a couple of these things i've already got planned like up and running i'm gonna i'm gonna start acting again you know that's that will make me happy uh and right. then I can tell people well, it's never too late to start your acting career. Um <laughs> or or to pick up where you left off. But you or are such a great storyteller and very expressive and warm and vulnerable. I think your vulnerability and authenticity is part of your strength as a storyteller and will be as an actor again. Uh um, well, let me ask you another question. Um about poverty, living in the South and the Midwest. In one interview, you said poverty unifies a lot of people's struggles, regardless of race, gender, orientation. Now, I wanted to ask you, what do you want people to understand about this reflection of reality and horror and how we use the genre to process those things? Well, I think there's two aspects to that. I think one is the portrayal, but this is in cinema and media kind of across the board. It's very... It's it's very much a trope that city, you know, rich city folks go into the, you know, the hills or the mountains and meet like, you know, crazy hillbillies. Like that's just kind of a genre trope that goes back as far as I can remember. And so I think part of it's being mindful of how we portray people. Um because, you know, there I grew up in like, you know, the you know back hills of eastern kentucky so we were a very you know poor area but we weren't poor in that i mean we had we were financially poor but we also had our we had a farm so we could you know grow our food so we were always you know fed and we you know met mom made sure we had nice clothes and so we weren't we were poor in a traditional sense but we weren't poor in like a life sense um and there's a big sense of community that you know people don't I don't think they realize just how strong the sense of community is in a very positive way and that people will um, do any, you know, especially in the South and the Midwest, like when I go to small towns and stuff, the people there are so nice. 
and we'll give you the shirts off their back, you know, if you need it, like they will completely help a stranger. And that's the way it, that's what I experienced um, and how I experience it, even when I travel to those areas now. And so I think there's stereotyping that we do in our minds that oftentimes re get reflected in the movies um, that we make. So I think films, especially horror, can can do more to kind of, say, you know, just because it's, it's again, it's easy to the fish out of water story. So it's like, well, if you're going to take somebody and pluck them somewhere, you know, most people, a lot of people don't come from like, like the Appalachia, you know, mountains, you know, and stuff like that. So to them, that's like the most foreign thing, place they can think of in America. So I think kind of looking at those stereotypes can help with the film community. And then, you know, I, I always say, I think horror films are, most people that I talk to, it's it's a good release for them for whatever anxieties that they have. Um, you know, just like with comedies, you can go in a theater and you can laugh with an audience in a very communal experience. With horror films, you go into a theater and you get tense and you can yell and scream and you know, and then it's safe at the at the end of the day. So you can get a lot of the negative kind of stuff that you're holding inside. You can get that out and release that in a in a theater in a very safe way. Um, in a fun way. So I think that's why I think horror films just kind of crowd a, cut across every demographic that there is. Like there are horror fans from, you know, just every label of humans that we can put on on humans. There are horror, horror fans in that that category. So true. Yeah, I love how it helps us see people in a new way. And the other thing you said, my favorite part of the horror genre is well, and this is kind of how I see it, that the ending of a horror movie or a story is always going to come at too great a cost. And the reason that fulfills me is because sometimes life is like that. The yeah. ending is completely bleak. The moment feels wrong. And yet I have to find a way to process that and accept it. Yeah. And I think that that's true of a lot of horror films. Is is, And they're all just as effective. I, I think you have the the horror films where the ending is kind of bleak or, or leaves you kind of feeling like, uh, like at least my life's not that bad. <laughs> um, but if that person can get through it, I can get through it. And then you, then you have the more fun kind of horror films that are again, a roller coaster ride of emotion. So you go from laughing to being scared to being frightened. Um, but it do usually doesn't matter what the genre is. It's like, usually the key is that you connect with the main character. Like if you've, you know, hopefully all the characters, but definitely if, if your audience is connecting with your main character, um, they've invested something in that character. So they want the best for him or her at the end of the day. And if that doesn't happen, sometimes it's like, oh, that really, that really hit me in the gut. Like, and, you know, that's another intentional, like, primal emotion a lot of horror films want to evoke, too, um, which can be great. Yeah, I mean... I've always, and again, I, I credit this to my mom. Um, it's so funny because I always give all the credit to my mom and then people are like, what about your dad? And it's like, well, my dad cheated on my mom. So my mom kicked his ass out of the house, you know, and this was back in the day when you did not kick your husband out of the house for cheating. You kept him around. And so um, I'm very, yes, I'm very happy with my mom's life choice in that decision. Um, but she did. Because again, we grew up in an area where I experienced, you know, some some racism. And again, it was it wasn't because these people are were bad people. It's just they had never had anybody live in the community that wasn't white. So they had prejudices. You know, this was the 80s, like the civil rights movement only happened in the late 60s. So they had never seen anybody. So they just had backwards notions about who people were that weren't white. And that was all coming from television and what their parents had told them. And, you know, so it, so it took some time to adjust, but, you know, my mom was always like, you know, nobody's better than you because that was kind of the thing. And then she's like, but you're, no, you're no better than anybody else. Like we're all, we're all as valuable on this planet as anybody else. So she, that's just a life lesson that she put in me that, you know, has never gone away. And so I tend to, you know, not live my life with regrets. Like if, if I do things I regret, I own up to it and I talk about it and I'm honest about it. Cause I, 
you know, for me, I didn't see many, any, many people that look like me on TV and I'm also gay. So, you know, growing up, like I didn't have any gay role models, you know, to look up to on TV because nobody was out back then. Um, I think Clyde Barker is probably one of the first people that I knew that came out that I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Cause again, you're, you're growing up in a place and a world where everything you're hearing, you know, whether it's at church or whether you're hearing it in your own family, when they see a gay couple on TV and they're like, Oh, that's disgusting. None of my kids will ever turn out that way. Or you're hearing, you know, people saying, oh, you know, gay people are all pedophiles. And it's like, you're growing up, you're like, I'm none of those things, but I'm gay, but maybe I can change. And I try to change and I can't change, you know, which is something we're going, we're recycling back to today um, in society, which is very frustrating. But um, yeah, so there was just a lot of stuff that I had to deal with where I was, I felt like I was less than other people. Um, and so my mom was always very encouraging about that part. She didn't know I was gay, but I always, horrible joke, but I always joke that racism saved my life because all those, all the, you know, self-esteem my mom was pushing and pumping into me about, you know, my race and not being ashamed of that. And there's nothing, you know, all that stuff I was also siphoning off, you know, to help process myself, you know, being gay. So, um, so that, that kind of life lesson and just being honest, because I have had several times over my career, I've had people come up to me at conventions or festivals and several people. And, and I've known many people who've tried to take their own lives in the LGBTQ community. And I've had several people come up to me and be like, you know, I grew up in a small town. Some of them grew up in big towns. Like it's not just a small town thing. But I grew up in a family and, you know, they didn't accept me and I was on the streets and I was going to kill myself. And then I found out, like, the guy that did my favorite movie is gay and that gave me gave me inspiration. And, you know, these are true stories. Like, these aren't, like, made up, like, things that I'm saying just to, you know, make a point. Like, these are, these, this is, and, but even one, if, if only one person had done that, this has happened several times like over my career but if only even one person like did not commit suicide because i've been out i'm like you know what i will take whatever shit you know that this has a whatever negative effect this has on my career which is i'm absolutely sure that there's been a negative i know that people outside of hollywood are like oh it's such a you know only you know it only it's a great thing and oh, i don't know it's not the people still have their misconceptions and their prejudices so um, but I'm like, I don't care, like, because I'm, I'm not about like, fame or money. Like, I still have that little plot of land, my sister and I still have our farm little plot of land back in Kentucky. I'm like, if things ever get bad, I can just always go back there. <laughs> like, I know how to farm. I haven't forgotten how to farm. And if you um, denied that part of yourself, think of all the people, even if it was just one, who would not have felt not just that they had hope to survive, but felt enriched, that you helped them see their own worthiness because they saw it in you. Yeah. And again, it's, it's for me, that's why I think, and again, you can't, I, I'm not saying everybody should be out, like, because I, I know the world is still an ugly, cruel place. And, you know, especially if you're, in certain positions like you know teachers or actors you know there there's still a lot of concern about how you're going to be viewed and things like that so I, I don't think anybody should be forced out but again I don't want like the only time I knew people were gay growing up was if somebody had a got AIDS and died you know and so fortunately I was a very smart kid <laughs> So I found out like the name of the Oscar Wilde bookstore in New York. And this was in, this was in, this was in high school. And I called them and I got some like movies like Maurice, which is a Merchant Ivory, wonderful gay love story. And Another Country, which is another great English movie. And so, I, you know, I found ways to educate myself. Um, and because I, I, I knew at a certain point, it's like, I can't change this. Like this is, I'm just... This this is the way I am. Like I I can't. I prayed about it. I did all the things you're supposed to do, and um, it's like I I can't change this. And so, 
I know I'm a good person. I know I'm not all these bad things that people say about me, but I sure really wish that there were other, I had somebody to even look at, you know, as an example or that I could have a happy life or be a, you know, that I am a normal person. Um, so if I can be that for anybody, like, I'm like, that's more important to me than, you know, money or a job, you know, yeah. and it always will be. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, I think you have been that person. You've been that person for me, uh, my wife, she, uh, you know, you inspire us. Um, and I, I really can't wait to show people this interview. You've given some <laughs> wonderful answers. Um, if I could ask you something more deeper about your mom and coming out. Mm -hmm. So, um, you said that when you came out to her, she said some awful stuff and that it inspired a scene in Tamara. Let me give you the quote from the interview. You said that the lesbian character ended up in the script for Tamara possessing her parents and her parents tried to kill her. You know, this was based off of something your mom said when you first told her that you were gay. You said, my mom came around very quickly to accept me, but the first thing she said to me was like, you might as well have stuck a knife in my heart. Um, yeah. You said, you know, that's something you don't forget. And now, first of all, I'm sorry that happened, but I'm glad she came around. Yeah. That just makes me think about how your lived experience inspires your art and how that changes all the time. And I'd like to imagine we're able to go back in time in this situation. I'm your producer for Tamara. I'm your financier. And I tell you, this is the part we have to get right. It has to be authentic. How would you write that scene today? You know what? I think I would probably write it the same way because I, because um, a, a little bit on my on my mom, like that that was the first thing she said, um, and then she just cried for like three days straight. It was um, it was I, I have learned the, but I've learned several things that I didn't think of at the time. Like I've learned that just like it takes us a long time to come to terms with who we are because of all the stuff that society says about us, we have to give our parents that grace too because they are they had this whole future in their heads about what we were gonna do and be in our lives. And they're having to like let that go and accept who we really are. And I, my mom probably had to know, I mean, I look at videos of me and you know, like I was a typical like, you know Nelly little kid like I'm like I don't know how you didn't know <laughs> um but you know we have to give and it's you know and I think that this is probably a good lesson for kids today because I don't I think kids today are we get a they're probably a little more spoiled and there's more social acceptance so they people assume the world's like that and I still I know people to this day who are older that haven't come out to their parents because their parents they they know will disown them I, I meet people who are kicked out on the streets. You know, I talked at, at, you know, LGBT youth events and meet kids who are homeless because their parents kicked them out. And this is like now. And now that we're getting back into this whole bullshit groomer, you know, side stuff where it's like, you know, actually most kids that are molested are molested by a family member or a family friend. Like, so what if you're really worried about groomers, like, let's start with being factual instead of bullshit but that's a whole other conversation but the damage that it does to not just lgbtq people but even straight kids like i you know let me word this so you know is in a way not to yeah this but in college like there were over the years you know colleges where a lot of people go off and they're away from home and they get curious and they experiment like I have I had numerous encounters in college with guys that were just, you know, I want to try this once, you know, or you know what I'm saying, or like don't tell anybody. And they're married now and they have kids, and I know that they have never done anything else. They were just curious. But we do damage to straight men who are because even if a gay thought crosses their mind, all of a sudden they start freaking out. That's that's why we have so much homophobia, I think, and and violence against our community is because you know it you know the the whole joke is like if women ex, you know have sex with each other like it doesn't mean they're lesbian but if a guy like 
touches a penis at one point in his life, he's com- completely gay. Like we still have that stupid societal thing. And so all these guys who, again, if they accidentally get a boner when they're wrestling with another guy, it's going to freak them out. Um, so we, we just do a lot of damage with just throwing all this kind of stereotypical bullshit around. Um, it's very, it's very frustrating, but, but my mom came around literally three days later, it was three days of crying. And then she had to take me back to college and we were driving back with her best friend and her, (laughs) that's what I love about country women. They just keep it real. My mom the same way, but her best friend was like, Betty, will you just shut up? Like you're being ridiculous. He's the same kid. He's always been, you just know something that you didn't know about him, but it's not like he's different. And my mom literally quit crying. And then she was, she worried a little bit about my safety. You know, she's like, I'm worried that somebody's going to hurt you. And, you know, she, she didn't want me to, she didn't want the neighbors to know for a while, but that's, I think that's a, that's an every person thing where you don't want anybody knowing your family's business. So she didn't want the neighbors to know for a while, but it wasn't because she was ashamed. She was like, I just don't, it's none of their business. This is our business. Um, But yeah, she came around pretty, pretty quickly, but I kind of, I knew she would because I, I know my mom and I know that in her heart, like, you know, she was somebody who grew up in Eastern Kentucky and she also, you know, she married a black man, you know, and this was before the civil rights movement. So she, I knew that she had experienced more of the world and had a broader mind than she was acting. But when it comes to your own child, that's when I think it's hard, you know? Yes. And in that moment, like you said, it's something he'd been, you'd been, finding clarity over your entire life and then yeah. she just found out that day of course she didn't know yeah. you have to allow people that very human reaction give them a chance to come back once they've thought about it once they've had a chance to process it yeah and i think that's really important because i think again especially and it's not even just young people today i think it's probably everybody like we're so used to now everything being so accessible like we expect people to change their their way of thinking overnight or we're like well somebody thinks this way they're stupid and it's like well no like you don't know anything about that person's life you know prejudice of any kind isn't innate we're not born prejudiced like we learn it through our life experiences and whether it's coming from something bad that's happened to us or whether it's coming from the fact that we feel like you know our lives are really bad and and you know nobody's helping us and we feel like angry and stress stressful and rudderless um and you know that can lead to a lot of the hatred that comes out it all comes from some place and so if we don't engage each other to have conversations like we're not going to ever get to the we're never going to get to a solution and i think i think we will but i i i think that certainly society and social media does not thrive on bringing us together like it thrives on keeping us fighting as much as possible um and politics the same way like it's all it's all about keeping us mad at each other um and attacking our neighbors and that way we also don't have to look at our own house and keep it clean like Uh if if we're busy fighting those fighting those gays then we don't have to worry about why all of our friends are divorced you know and it's like yes and i think that's borne out by when you see people who are motivated by destroying the same people or group of people once those people are defeated, they turn on themselves because their conversation was never about coming together. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Let me ask you something different. We're almost to the real short, fun questions that. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, could you talk a little more about your comments to Dread Central about diversity of cast and crew. I loved your comments. It's kind of something you talked about earlier where, um, uh, like, for example, Tamara, you said that even though Jenna is fantastic in the role, but there was originally, at your suggestion, a woman of color who was up for the role, a singer, Maya, I think. Um, Oh, yeah, I did. I did say her name. I thought I had avoided saying her name, which is fine. Oh, no, no, I did. I said it. That's fine. no she but it wasn't even my suggestion like they I didn't even see her audition like they called me up after she auditioned and they were like holy like we found the we found the actress like and 
yeah and so this was the director and the producers that found her like i they called me up and they're like what do you think about her because she killed it and i was like well i'd love to see her audition but i i love her like i think she's a great performer i just you know i wasn't there in the audition um but yeah the business people were like no we can't sell it we can't sell it you know because then it'll be people think it's a black film i'm like you can just put her in the middle of the poster with a whole bunch of other people um and um yeah that, that's just another and this was after moulin rouge had come out you know like she this was a, the one of her peaks and many peaks but um, it was going to be a time that was it yeah but again that's the reality of the business that people don't see like the best no i, I won't say the best actors because again i jenna friggin kills it and i can't see anybody else in the role now aside from her but i'm just saying that oh god there's no way to nice like but the person that came in that initially got the role did not get the role simply because she was black and they were like we need a white person in the lead of this film and that's that's the simple business that we've whether we're writers directors actors that's that's the reality of the life that we've lived and it's not even been that long it's been like the last you know it's been like this for 50 years for me like i've seen i absolutely have seen changes for the better especially in the last decade hmm. um but i've also seen that change come with a lot of pushback and again you know my thing is it's like you again people that don't haven't lived this experience and it's also the same thing with with poor people like it's you know if you haven't been poor like you can talk about poverty all you want to but you don't understand how it if how it affects people how it brings people together how it can also tear them apart how it can also contribute to like you know depression but it also communities come together so there's negatives and and positives i think the positives are just kind of the human spirit but um you know there's such a pushback now about diversity and again it's like of course when it's pandering like that's annoying for everybody yes. but it's not like they're just running out and going hey let's go find unqualified people of color to f to take all these jobs it's like oh you know what the reality is oh you know what we used to never consider any of those people of color and this is not just black this is like latinos and 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 asian americans and you know you, you know muslim like everybody like every person that's not white you know it's like oh we never used to consider them for this role ever and so now we're actually looking at their actual talent to see if they would be right for this role like that's what's actually happening in hollywood um on a basic level like sure there there are some instances where again somebody's just probably pandering but the majority of it is like again people to quote to quote the fresh prince people just don't well parents don't understand but it was a song but people don't understand like there was like nobody ever looked at us for stuff for specific stuff like leading roles leading you know even co-star roles it was always like the best friend who was like you know the fourth or fifth build sassy person and if you were gay it was like yeah the same exact thing like they just but they would never consider you for certain roles and now they're finally going oh well let's look at all the talent in this pool too and see who's the best so i know when the light's not shining on the pool that you're in it feels like you're being like ignored or you know people conflate being ignored now to being like oppressed like we're you know we're now we're we're the victims of all this stuff and it's like but no it's like the light there's still the lights there's they can shine light on both pools and that would be ideal but since they haven't ever shown the light on that pool over here like they're just looking at it all of a sudden because it's a new discovery it's like oh my god there's all there's all this talent of color that we never thought of to could write horror movies wow we never thought a woman could direct a horror movie what um so it's it's um yeah we're we're we'll get there eventually but man people people just don't like people don't like change <laughs> or they don't they don't like they don't like it when the lights like not on them yeah especially people who have grown up in the light they don't know what it's like to not be validated as a simple basic fact of their existence and have to share that with other people it's like the saying for people of privilege equality feels like oppression yeah and the thing is and i always say this about 
you know, because again, it's, we're very good in this world about taking positive words or negative words and spinning them. But the th thing is, I, we need to come up with a new word for privilege, because I think when you say privilege, people think about, about money, like that's what they think. And privilege isn't money. Privilege is when you have the luxury of something that other people don't. So as a man, I have the luxury of not having to walk around at night with a rape whistle and maze, something that women have to do. I have the luxury of not having to do that. As a person who's got darker skin, I have the luxury of, you know, not getting sunburned easily. You know, it's, 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 it's not that the world is open to you because of course, like you try telling poor, poor white people in the cities or the suburbs, like they have privilege and they're like, well, I don't have any privilege. Like I'm fucking poor. Like that's so again, that word's been kind of manipulated where again, it's not about wealth and it's been weaponized where people just throw that around all the time too. It's like, again, I, there's a, there's problems on every side of every issue. So when you try to shut people out from discussions like when you say shut up white people you can't have this discussion you're not helping anybody by doing that and a lot of times it's white people telling you know it's 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 well-meaning white people telling other white people to shut up and let the black people talk and it's like no um but even if you're a person of color like shutting anybody out of a solution is not gonna help solve a problem like we're all human beings at the end of the day so you know we all have to come together as a community as a human community to solve all these human problems like yeah it's um there's a lot to process yeah well and you've kind of spoken to uh, i was going to ask you what you see as a meaningful path forward but it also sounds like you're saying we are on that meaningful path have hope it is happening but it will take time it will take time there will be pushback and i think the the thing that we all have to be mindful of is we can't we have to have and this is the biggest thing that stresses me out about people is we have to have empathy for where people are coming from. We may not understand their feelings. We may not agree with their feelings. Um, and we can say all we want facts aren't feelings, but I hear every side of every issue throwing that up in everybody's face when the timing's right, you know, it's like, well, you know, yeah, you, you can keep throwing it. You can keep both sides in every issue until the end of the day, until the end of time, but then you're not, you're still not having a solution. And it's like, so we, we should always demand equality because that's something that's a basic human right is just to be treated equal to everybody else. We should always demand that, but we also do mindful of how we're demanding it, um, how we're doing it to make sure that we're not putting, we're not trampling other people down in our quest for our personal stuff, you know, like I could be very, if I wanted to, like, I, yeah, like I could have gone down a very bitter, angry life path for things that happened when I was young. Um, and if I came from that place, I would, yeah, I would just be mowing over people because I, I'm like, well, I feel like I deserve this because of all the shit that I went through and, and not caring about other people. Um, and I think that that's probably where a lot of this comes from is like we just see yeah i think we're i think we're on the right path it's just it's it's always a path you have to be diligent to like keep walking forward on but you i think we always still have to be mindful of li at least listening or trying to under put ourselves in other people's shoes because my life experience is different than any other gay person's life experience you know, my experience as a person of color is different because I'm biracial. So I'm lighter skinned than black, you know, dark skinned black people. Um, so, you know, like I have, I, you just have to be open. I think you have to be open and, and listen and especially listen to people that you don't agree with. Cause once you sit down and talk to most people that you don't agree with hot button issues on, once you start talking to them and you find like, oh, this is a human being and they're just as, you know, they just want the best for their families and they're worried about their place in the world. And they're, yes, they're getting stirred up because they're watching, going down way too many rabbit holes on the internet and, and, you know, listening to way too many crazy things, but they're not a bad person. Um, we have to give everybody the, the grace of change, I guess is actually after I babbled for like 
20 minutes. I think that's what it is, is like, again, any kind of prejudice is not innate, it's learned. And through exposure to other people and just seeing people that are, you know, meeting people who are from different cultures and different backgrounds and different beliefs, usually open people up to at least like, oh my God, everybody, we're all human beings. At the end of the day, underneath all these labels that we throw on top of ourselves, we're all human beings. So let's treat each other like human beings and and at least be respectful of other people's humanity. Um, I see that happening, but that only happens if you actually engage people. And I see too many people going, well, if somebody still believes this ignorant thinking in this day and age, and that's their problem. And it's like, no, it's it's not. There's a reason they did that. But if you shut them off, I guarantee you, like, the really hateful, evil people will be like, come on in our group. Like, you know, doors wide open over here, you know, come join our white supremacist group. We will accept you and all, all your, you know, that, that ha that's happening. I mean, you know, if we don't open our hearts to people who don't agree with us, there are people, there are very bad actors and actresses out there who will definitely use those people's like frustration and alienation to like pull them into like much darker seedier stuff so yes and the hard part for me is having uh, seeing worthiness in those people as well because they're not coming from a bad place like that like you said um that maybe they've experienced some kind of oppression that they never healed some kind yeah. of trauma as a child some kind of oppression they live with day to day that unfortunately has such a drastic impact on things. If only they were whole in that way, this thing would heal itself, but they're really in pain. Yeah. Uh, um, well, if I may move on to, um, yeah. let's see. Uh, you mentioned uh, to Dread Central that you're increasingly less able to let stuff bounce off of you. You mentioned that you thought you, you put on a good front, but you're actually sometimes quite troubled by the state of things for queer people. And, um, you know, I asked my wife about that and I told her it was striking that your answer to that question was so different than what I'd gotten from some of my more recent interview subjects. When I mm -hmm. simply asked them to think about what would the world look like when you were gone? And, and you know what my wife says? She says, Stephanie, of course, those other people are hopeful. They're straight white women. The world is made a little more precisely for them to feel seen and appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think part of my, um, I think part of where that comes from is you do get a little worn down. Like I, again, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been around for over fifty years, and I've, you know, so I started off at the right after you know being born right after the civil rights movement so i've seen the progress we've made but i've also seen along with that progress i've seen the arc of 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 our society going from um you know welfare moms with reagan you know which again i grew up in the where there were no black people where i grew up like that whole idea about welfare moms perpetuated the stereotype that black women were having a bunch of babies and we're on welfare when it's like that's not the reality it was mostly you know white people are on welfare <laughs> um where when miss when vanessa williams got nominated or got crowned miss america like i remember the backlash about that you know it was like public and i mean it was very public she didn't represent real america you know um so i've seen for every step of progress we've made i've also seen the pushback that comes with it and the same thing with you know with gay rights, you know, it's like for every positive step we make, you know, there's, there's, they're always finding some way, like it usually happens around election time where they find some way to make race or, or gay rights, like a centerpiece of drama. And, you know, it's, it always, it's just, I keep seeing it like repeating itself and I see it repeating itself again today and today where it's getting crazy is like it's like let's just pretend, pretend that racism is completely gone somehow magically in the last 50 years it's just disappeared um when we see evidence so strongly indicating that it's not and it's you know there's when you talk about racism we tend to just talk about black and white but again there 
racism affects all the races and including some white people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Um, I've met some people of, of many different ethnicities that were racist against white people. So it's, it's, you know, it's, that's a human, again, a human condition problem that we have, but to act like it doesn't exist or minimize it or act like acknowledging it is like crying victim. Um, it's just, I, I get exhausted from it because I, it seems like we're always, it's like, it seems like women always have to defend themselves about why, you know, when explaining sexism or, you know, fear of assault or the real danger of being assaulted as a woman, it's like, you know, women have to, are the ones that have to defend that. And it's like, if I feel like people of color, we're the ones that are always having to explain and justify and explain why racism is real and explain how we see it. Um, and as a gay person, the same thing with homophobia, like, I guess the big elephant in the room is religion because that's really the only thing that that throws up but i'm a religious person so i'm i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bash religion sure. but sure. what i tell my religious friends who are who i've really sat down and had like meaningful conversation with this is like i'm like i can respect your religious beliefs but i'm like we have friends that have been married like four times and if you're going by your religious beliefs, then they're adulterers. And I said, you've been to their four weddings. Baker, religious bakers have made all of their wedding cakes and never said, hey, we can't do this because we're promoting adultery. Every time they go out in public with their spouse, they're shoving their adultery in your faces. And you've never had a problem with that. So I said, you have to understand why as gay people, like we feel like we're being singled out. Like if, if you're really just boiling this down to like behavior, not the person, I was like, wh why have you not said you would never go to Bob's like fourth wedding because he's an adulterer and his wife's an adulterer and they're celebrating their adulterer. I said, why did you go to their wedding? But you're like, I won't go to a gay wedding. And he's like, oh, I never thought about it that way. And it's like, well, but that's, you know, I'm talking to you at your level. Like this doesn't mean that that we agree on it on things but i'm just i'm saying talking to you with where you're coming from like this is why there's a problem in society it's like you're holding us up to a 10 levels of judgment above everybody else and it's like we're not destroying marriage like the 50 percent of straight people who get divorced are destroying the institution of marriage why not focus on that yeah. we're not we're not molesting your kids like you're friggin' uncle and your grandfather and your neighbor is the one molesting kids why are you putting all this on us like um but that doesn't make for good drama <laughs> to be honest about what's going on in the world um so at least at least he understood what i was saying in that moment because he was like at first he tried to be like well you have to decide you have to define what a marriage is because maybe if the wife isn't having sex with the husband that's i'm like that's not in the bible <laughs> like you're just making that up like you know like if we're keeping it real you know let's keep it real like again i'm not asking you to change your beliefs on anything but just understand like we are singled out very intentionally and specifically for discrimination and laws and you know threats of violence and you know being kicked out kids being kicked out of their homes and forced on the streets you know time out grooming i mean that's where most of these kids are you know picked up uh, on the streets after their parents have kicked them out of their house so it's like it might make you feel good to feel like you're protecting somebody but you're not really and you are oppressing a group of people far above and beyond like what you say should be like the moral standard for everybody so if you're making about morality look at it that way yeah i think so i mean people just they want to feel like they're serving good and evil but no one passes that kind of purity test no one no 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 they don't and again we excuse you know our society excuses all the other you know ex you know excuses all the other stuff i don't say they excuse all of it but they will Again, I just use the the marriage thing because I think that's the most 
close uh, closely aligned because we're t they talk about behavior as opposed to the person and it's like again when i see one one baker or one website designer say that they will not make an adulterer's wedding cake or you can't support this person because they are an adulterer or this person can't be a teacher or this person should be fired because they've been married four times then i will believe that you are exercising your true belief system um, and of course you have the choice you know it's america you can choose what parts of your belief system you want to enforce and which parts you don't like yeah you can be a hypocrite but yeah don't don't act like you're being you know fair or just in your in your behavior when you are targeting a certain group of people you know it's like that with gay marriage as well as parenting you know for yeah. the idea that two men two women two non-binary people automatically worse parents than a heterosexual couple is ridiculous the stats yeah. are actually on our side that the straight people are bad for children you know that's what the numbers show well it's just it's also a simple matter of like you know we have so many kids in foster care and living in in bad situations with families that are abusive or you know have addiction issues and things like that it's like the thought that a kid is better off in a foster care system than being with a loving couple is you know just ludicrous i mean i mean we talk about you know how bad you know the covid lockdowns were because people didn't have this connection with each other it's like you have kids in foster care being shunted in and out of different homes every you know month or two months and that's not healthy for them um and just common sense tells you that it's not even about morality common sense tells you like putting a parent or a kid with a loving family is better than them being with a bad family or no family like it's that's just common sense like i would say so too Jeffrey, I got some fun questions for you. Fun questions. <laughs> I'm going to warn you, the fun questions are where people tend to need to think the most. Okay. <laughs> so first, let me take a question. drink of water. Let me take a okay. drink of water before we get to the fun questions. Okay. You ready? Yep. First fun question. What's your favorite word? Oh. Look at you thinking, I told you. I know, that's a hard one. I don't know, oh my gosh, I don't know what my favorite word is, to be honest. You're welcome to say, let me think on it and we'll come back. Yeah, no, I, I want I wanna, I want it to come to, come to me because I shouldn't have to think that hard. Um, no worries. How yeah. about your least favorite word? My least favorite word is... Probably the N word or the F word. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, probably no is my least favorite word. Oh, yeah. No is my least favorite word. Um, what is the sound you love? Um, babies laughing. Like I friggin' love babies laughing. Uh, what is the sound you hate? Baby's crying. <laughs> but also Freddy Krueger's nails against the chalkboard. Yeah. Or metal pipe. Oh, yeah. Grima. That's insane. That's screech. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you could take only one movie, one book, one music album to a desert island, which three would you take? Um... If I could take one book, it would probably be, it would probably be a religious book. Um, probably A Thief in the Night, which is about investigating kind of the origins of my faith. So I'd probably take that book. That would be interesting to read. Um, could you tell me a little more about that? I've, I, I read a little bit about your faith, but have not seen you talk about it much. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a Baha'i. Um, it's a religion that's been around for about 175 years. It started in, in Persia. Um, and it's, you know, for me, it's just a cool religion. Like, I don't talk about it much just because we're not allowed to proselytize. Um, so it's not, 
it's not like we can't talk about it. It's just like we're just not, you know, because other a lot of religions are based on you have to like spread the word and convert people and we're just that's just not we're not allowed to do that so so we're not trying to like force we're not trying to convert people because yes. because that's just historically trying to convert people to one's religion has always led to religious yeah. violence you know yeah. so yeah it's really just about not converting people fraction um, instead of conversion absolutely yes. absolutely so it's living re living a life and and again certainly not hiding it like i just i sort i talk about it but i don't i don't lead with it because then i'm i'm just worried that i kind of cross over into that line of like it's going to sound like i'm proselytizing um because people are very sensitive to that um yeah in this in this in this day and age too but i i think all the time like you know i certainly grew up getting proselytized about you know to a lot so um but no it's you know the fundamentals are very much like the oneness of religion meaning that you know that that all the word religions kind of come from one god that's basically revealing messages to mankind as mankind evolves over over time so as society evolves and is kind of ready to hear like the next manifestation kind of laying out the next set of guidelines for living a good life if you will um that manifestation comes so we believe like that all the world's religions are part of the same kind of message um just through different manifestations and then a lot of social lessons like the equality of the races the equality of men and women um science and religion have to be in harmony like we believe that you know science you know that faith without science is superstition like if you believe you know if you if you think the world is flat when the science has proven that it's round like you've got to let your spiritual thinking line up with your the science because we believe like i don't know science has always been posited as like the enemy of religion hmm. when it's really not like science isn't about science is actually in my my view is actually proves like the wonders of like the world like you know i can't get my head around what who god is you know it's a concept that's much bigger than my puny little human brain can imagine but you know even if even if you believe like the big bang theory is the start of the universe like w what a miracle that is like millions of years ago like the perfect alignment of stuff happened to like explode a universe into creation and yeah, evolve into no, like no. where we're at now like that's freaking insane like but it also means we're all connected you know um we all come from the same stuff um you know and also the education is important and ending ending the extremes of wealth and poverty so that's why it's it's i do talk a lot about poverty and you know equality and the importance of education and the need to like right rise up the you know raise up the the poor and and make sure that the extremely wealthy don't you know take off but those are like religious principles for me like that's you know so it's it's i try to be mindful of how i talk about things but it's just like the 10 commandments for christians you know it's like you know these are like social they are social issues but they're spiritually important for the betterment i think of just the human race is like to to make sure that we you know that we again balance out the poor you know because we should we're such a wealthy world we there shouldn't be any poor people especially in this country that's ridiculous but you know these are they sound like social issues when i talk about them but they're spiritual issues for me mm -hmm. um so that's why i try to tell people like eat if you're going to bring your religion into to to my life like respect that my religion is teaching me not the opposite of what jesus did Je what jesus said and did was awesome but yeah. <laughs> but what you're doing now is not exactly yes yes you know so for me so for so often it's when it becomes a system of control yeah that's not what's helping we yeah. need things to bring into awareness 
the normal variations within all of humanity and why we're all worthy. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. well is, is it okay um, if I include what you shared about your faith? Oh, um, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, okay, okay. Um, now, you had a minute. What's your favorite word, sir? Um, I'm just going to say yes. I think yes is probably it. Yes never usually leads to a bad, a bad anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes before I quit drinking, yes, sometimes led to bad things. But um. <laughs> oh. oh, I see. Um, you stopped drinking, eh? Um. Yeah, like f over fifteen years ago. So. Just uh, went to went uh, sober, totally sober. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! I understand. I've yeah. had some issues myself. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always, I always share that part too, just because it's, you know, that's certainly in, it's in entertainment, but it's in every segment of society. Like addiction is such a still, it's such a rampant problem. All, you know, whatever, whatever is under the addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, smoking, shopping, set, you know, whatever the addiction is, it's, yeah. it's so prevalent in our society. We just still don't, talk about it in an open and honest way and it's still a stigma so i'm like yeah we gotta at some point we gotta deal with this man <laughs> yeah wow i'm glad you mentioned that i didn't expect us to talk about that yeah let's see well those are all the questions i got one last one for you to close this out jeffrey i wonder yeah. what would you like to be remembered for um uh, it's funny i've only been asked this question twice but that's been in the same week so that's interesting. Um, I, you know what, I would like to be remembered as somebody who, this sounds so cheesy, but somebody who made the world a better place for the people that knew him or knew of him, you know, that somebody who just left, a, left the world a better place than he arrived in it. Yeah. Because um, I, that's my, that's always been my goal. It's like, I'm sure at some point I've hurt somebody's feelings or, you know, I, I know nobody's perfect. I'm sure something has happened at some point where somebody, you know, was either uh, upset or upset, bothered by me. But I, I can say like in a world where I just see people being very um, just rotten to each other a lot of times or doing everything, they, anything they can to kind of get ahead or if they're hurting, instead of dealing with their hurt, they're going to get online and start bashing a bunch of other people. Um, I really try not to do that. So I, I, I don't think I have many people, and I'm sure you know, I'll regret saying this, because some, some internet sleuth will find somebody who hates me. But you, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that doesn't like me or has something super negative to say about me that knows me. Like sometimes I ramble too much in interviews, but um, and um, that's going to be the headline, Jeffrey. Yes, find somebody that hates Jeffrey Reddick. Uh, the headline uh, should be Jeffrey Reddick dares you to find somebody that hates him. That should be yeah, <laughs> and then they'll uh, definitely go and do it. <laughs> it'll be, it, that challenge will go viral within days. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for giving me so much of your time for this interview. I keep forgetting it's like, even though it's Friday, like it's still a work day. I mean, even though I work from home, it's still a work day for, and it's Friday. So I'm like, I'm ready to kick back for the weekend, but I'm like, oh yeah, the week's not over yet. <laughs> so. Oh boy. And things are picking up again in um, Hollywood now that the strike. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly but surely. Um, Cause the actors are still striking. So we're still out there supporting them and you know waiting for them i, I don't think that that strike is going to last particularly as long as ours did um but it'll take a while for everybody to get get back on course hmm. well as long as that next final destination movie is back on course i could care less about the rest well when yeah when the strike is over like you know obviously there's like still stuff that has to happen before production actually goes into play but um yeah it's it's excited. the team you've got for that movie is a group of excellent storytellers the pen oh my God. i cannot imagine the quality of this next installment i i'm really excited like but for the new yeah for the new final destination i really feel like we got it an a-team 
I shouldn't say we, it, you know, it is my, it is my baby, but you know, um, I feel like the studio got an A team together for the, for the new one. So I'm very, very happy. Welcome everyone to flight 180, the last flight you'll ever take. This is your captain speaking, and today we'll be flying on a Boeing 747-200B, one of the finest in the fleet. Our final destination is Paris, France. I pity none of you will survive long enough to actually get there. So sit back, relax, stretch out your feet, and get ready to die in the most gruesome way. I'm being passed a note. It seems our executive producer, Brent Hearn, is on the plane, and he's had a premonition. Yes, yes, he's urging people to get off the plane. Well, if you want to know how well that really won't work out, you should probably stay on the plane, sit back, relax, and watch Final Destination again. Remember, in the event of a water landing, the corpse of your seatmate can be used as a flotation device. Not that it matters, because you'll be fish food as well. Take care now. <laughs>